Perhaps you're thinking of buying a big fat seven seat SUV for the family. And maybe you're gonna save a few thousand bucks on the way through and opt for the poverty powertrain in the lineup. These front drive SUVs, okay, if you tick that box, I fear you might just discover the vehicle's kind of hard to live with over time. Details next. I'm John Cadogan from autoexpert.com.au and I get new cars cheap for buyers here in Australia. Hit me up on the website for that. This is an issue that's kind of bugged me for some time, okay? And it's pretty hard for ordinary car buyers, like non-enthusiast car buyers, to get this dialed in and make the right choice in the domain of perspective, right? When you look at some arbitrary SUV model range, it doesn't have to be a particular one. They're pretty much all like this. There is generally a premium powertrain and a poverty powertrain. And on the way through to parking that shiny new car in your driveway, you really have to pick one. And you better hope you make the right choice because you can't change it after you've signed. The premium powertrain is often the one with all wheel drive. And a lot of people go, well, I don't wanna go camping. We'll go with front drive, which the poverty powertrain typically is. Sometimes there's a better engine with the all-wheel drive powertrain as well. Hyundai and Kia do that. A Toyota does not with vehicles like the Kluger, which has the same engine, a 3.5 litre Atmo V6 petrol engine. And the distinction there with Kluger is just all-wheel drive, premium, or front drive, poverty, with Kluger. Mazda borrows from this playbook, this Toyota philosophy, on this for CX-8 and CX-9. The CX-8 offers only the 2.2 diesel engine, either front drive or all-wheel drive for poverty and premium, respectively. And CX-9, ditto, a 2.5 litre turbo petrol 4 with all-wheel drive for premium and front drive for poverty. It costs you like four grand more to tick the all-wheel drive box for premium with Kluger and CX-8 and nearly four and a half grand in CX-9. Obviously, manufacturing this premium powertrain adds things like a transfer case, which is a gearbox module hanging off the back of the transmission, which splits the drive front and rear. Plus, of course, you have to pay for all of the rear drive componentry, like a prop shaft and rear differential and rear axles, you know, important stuff like that. So it's not as if they're just stitching you up on the price. All-wheel drive absolutely costs more and the extra price is justified. Over at Hyundai and Kia, the poverty powertrain in Sorrento and Santa Fe is also a 3.5 litre Atmo petrol V6 with front drive. But the premium is a 2.2 litre turbo diesel. It's a four cylinder and it comes with all-wheel drive. And the difference in price there is just 3,000 bucks, and I think the price gap shrinks there because V6 engines are expensive to build and package, okay? And I know I just said, like, just 3,000 bucks, like I'm friggin' Saudi Prince Mohammed bin Salman Al Saud or something, but what I actually mean is that three grand is a fair bit of cash if you just chuck it out the window one morning driving down the freeway, but Three grand is also a relatively minor proportional bump in the price in the context of already spending 50 or 60 grand on a new vehicle. The Santa Fe Active X petrol V6, the poverty powertrain, is about 47 grand plus on road costs, and the diesel's about 50. And I'd suggest most people who can afford to drop 47k on a new car can also afford to up the ante by three grand and spend 50 if it delivers a tangible benefit. And I'd further suggest to you that if you really can't stretch that high, then maybe you can't afford to spend the 47 grand in the first place. A late model used car might be a better fit for you in this situation. And hey, these things are expensive and not everyone buys new cars. I get that. Anyway, I'm pretty familiar with the 2.2 litre diesel in the all-wheel drive Santa Fe because I own one and I've been driving that since 2019. So... 
I recently grabbed a three and a half litre V6 ActiveX for evaluation for a week. ActiveX is one step up the Santa Fe lineup from what the French would call La Merde de Baissement, which roughly translates to uh, base model chitois, a common industry term here in Australia. Perhaps you think I'm joking on this. Well, I'm really not. Every senior executive in every car maker, every marketing boss, every product planner, and of course, every dealer principal knows exactly what a base model shitter is. No PowerPoint presentation required. So what I did here, okay, I really tried to make the case for the V6 front driver. Like, who's gonna buy this and be happy? Who is it right for? So my objective was not to kick the V6 gratuitously in the nuts right at the outset because, hey, it doesn't purport to be an equal kind of option to the diesel all-wheel drive. It's gonna be worse, and we all know it's not there to be as good, okay? But it is there in the range, and presumably it was put there with a buyer in mind. So kind of who is that? With the new Sorrento just lobbed and the new Santa Fe about to lob in a couple of months now, this is a bridge a lot of you are going to be crossing in coming months. And I just wanted to clarify the edges so you don't fall off the friggin' bridge in the middle of the span on the showroom floor making some snap decision that you maybe arrived unprepared for. Because the V6 is pumping all that drive to the front wheels, okay? And because it needs to rev to perform, it's really easy to spin the front wheels off the mark in that V6. In terms of motive power, you've only got about half of the traction potential of the all-wheel drive, and perhaps even a little less. Typically, you will feel this wheel spin when you dart out of a side street and onto an arterial road, and then you look like that, and you notice, inconveniently, a B-double bearing down on you unexpectedly at speed. So you give the accelerator a real squirt and then the inside front wheel starts to spin. Like, what else can it do? There's rearward weight transfer thanks to the pitch and right weight transfer thanks to the roll and the left front wheel is just sitting there unloading and hence it spins. Hashtag physics. They've done a pretty good job, actually, dialing back the throttle response in this situation, and the intervention of the traction control was pretty mild, too, on the times that I tested that, so well done there, you know, making this process as civilised as it can be. In the circumstances, the steering gets a bit squirmy, but it's, it's absolutely not full tilt torque steer, which feels like it can pull the wheel out of your hands in extremis. And this is absolutely not that, but it's still not as refined as the all-wheel drive option, which just grabs the road and goes. Front drive is also not the powertrain for towing. And I'm not talking a little unbrake box trailer for Renaults and refuse and landscape supplies and other domestic light duty stuff of that nature, you know. I'm talking about caravans and boats and heavy things like that. Front drive... Not a good fit on a real slippery boat ramp. Family adventuring like camping too, that's a consideration. Front drive is actually going to be fine if you only plan to go places where cars can go. If you're parked at a campsite and you look around like this and you see other cars like Corollas and Camrys, all good. But if you look around in the same way and it's kind of all blue singlets and bull bars and bogans, you're out of the envelope in the V6 with the front drive, okay? If it rains overnight, you could be camping there for quite some time. If you hate diesel because Volkswagen, it's filthy, or because a friend of a friend knows a guy who knows a guy whose DPF failed and that cost him a bomb, that's kind of irrational, I'd suggest. Modern diesels with actual Euro 5 emissions compliance, not purported Euro 5, but actual Euro 5, they're quite clean. And there's no suggestion Hyundai, Kia, DPFs have some sort of reliability problem, right? I have never had a complaint about that from an owner. 
they seem to be pretty robust, and I'm also pretty sure they're decent at passive regeneration, which is regeneration from just driving around normally, which is something a worse R&D DPF installation would be bad at. And that leads to a lot of the problems you hear about DPFs, the horror stories, right? I'd have to say, however, that a decent run on the highway every few weeks is really good for all cars. It purifies the oil and it knocks out a lot of the gunk that builds up inside them. Basically, diesel, petrol, highway running, really good idea, at least occasionally. Diesel's alleged extra servicing costs, we should cover that too, pretty much that's bullshit. However, if you have a catastrophic failure of, say, the injection system, and if it's not covered by warranty, for example, because you erroneously filled the car up one day with petrol, then the repair cost there is going to be higher than for a petrol engine. Substantially so. That is absolutely for sure. So, pro tip, don't do that. If you are concerned about the price of fuel, the diesel's going to use about three litres less fuel for every 100 k's. And when you factor in the different fuel retail prices of petrol and diesel, you're going to save broadly about three bucks every time you drive 100 kilometres in the diesel. And if you crunch the numbers on that, the break-even point on the price premium for the diesel is about 100,000 k's. So if you plan on owning that car for several years, you will ultimately be in front on the price of fuel in the diesel. It's about six years down the track for average drivers who are not on COVID-19 lockdown. And look, the diesel just goes better too. We should not lose sight of that. At least in most driving situations, it goes better, with the one exception being rolling overtaking manoeuvres. The petrol's 150 kilos lighter and it makes 40% more peak power. So it's got like 50% more power to weight ratio and flat out, it's just going to go better. So there's that to consider. But in the mid revs, which is where, let's face it, these vehicles are intended to be driven the vast majority of the time, the diesel is just going to go better because it makes more mid and low RPM power. So it's better for towing and ordinary driving in most situations, and it won't have to hunt through as many gears if you suddenly demand more performance, right? If it's got a shift from loping along to going for it, it's not as much of a shunt for the transmission because it doesn't have to spike the revs in order to deliver that required additional performance. The one final comment about Atmo V6s is, there's no getting around it. These things are dinosaurs and they are soon for the chop. I'm pretty sure Toyota shoves the V6 in the Kluger and Hyundai and Kia do that in Santa Fe and Sorrento because it's an easier sell in America. But in reality, the operational characteristics are fairly awful and outdated is probably a better term, the peak power doesn't happen until over 6,000 RPM, and you don't hit peak torque until 5,000. And that's not how you want to drive an SUV, right? Like, look at Mazda's 2.5 Turbo 4 in the CX-9 and the CX-5, and look at the 2.5 litre Turbo 4 Hyundai Kia just developed for the Sonata N-Line and future engines. I think they call that one Theta 3. Don't hold me to that. Like, there's an engine that just makes heaps of mid-range power. In fact, it makes as much mid-range power as the diesel and more peak power than the existing V6. Boning the V6 might well cost these companies sales in Retardistan, but in fact, that new 2.5 turbo engine is a far better fit for this kind of platform. Just saying, I mean, Hashtag facts, right? I'm kind of disappointed they didn't put that engine in the new Sorento, and I'm disappointed that it's probably not going in the new Santa Fe, because it would be a winner. But maybe with not quite as much differentiation between poverty and premium. Maybe it's a case of having a real choice between one and the other, and they're both kind of up there if they can be packaged with all-wheel drive. 
So anyway, after a week in the V6 front drive Santa Fe and really trying to give it the benefit of the doubt here, like the steel man argument rather than the straw manning thing, trying to see for whom it would be a good fit, I've come up with two categories of ideal buyer. And the first and most obvious one of those is the fleet buyer, typically a bean counter, right? Like Le Meurde de Baissement. V6. It's going to fit the balance sheet better if you need to buy 30 of these things over the next 12 months for your company and then turn them over in kind of two years time. And yes, they will be cheaper to own overall if you do that. I'm seeing that as a viable business proposition, as long as the business does not have one of those green fleet policies, which demands maximum of four-cylinder engines in all fleet vehicles. There's that to consider as well in some organisations. The employees who drive these vehicles will not give a crap. They just won't. Like Channel 7 and Channel 9, they both use Le Meurde de Besmont Klugers as camera crew cars, right? And I have never been in one, and I've been in dozens of these things, I've never been in one driving from A to B to do whatever and heard the driver, typically the cameraman, bitch about not getting all-wheel drive, right? They just don't do that. They go, yeah, it's all right, you know? If you're a private buyer, buying a car for yourself and the family, right? This is a little bit harder to justify. You need to be right up against your spending limit financially, and you need not to be planning on adventuring or heavy towing, okay? You need to be doing this because you've got six or seven mouths to feed, and you need to transport them from time to time, from various A's to various B's, and you need not to be a driving enthusiast, okay? The V6 front drive is not actually horrible. It's kind of okay, but it's hardly effortless and responsive in the mid-range, and it's really not as composed under pressure in the rain the way the diesel is for just three grand more. Just three grand. Ultimately, this is completely up to you, but you should make a rational determination about this and who you are and what you can afford to spend and what you really think you might be doing with this vehicle, you know? I'm happy to help you get a discount on either. I'm agnostic about whether the premium powertrain is right for you or not, but I really do want you to make the right decision. 